Welcome to a brand new deep dive. Today, we're tackling something absolutely critical, not just for exams like the MSRA SJT, but, well, for every single day, you'll work as a doctor. Yeah, we're talking about coping under pressure. Exactly. It's that skill of keeping your head and making good decisions when things feel, you know, completely overwhelming. And that's our mission for this deep dive, really, to give you the tools, the kind of frameworks to handle those high pressure clinical moments. We'll be using scenarios um, very much like the ones you'll see in the MSRA to really get under the skin of it. And I think it's important to say up front, this isn't about being some kind of superhero. Right? It's not about handling endless stress perfectly. Not at all. It's about making safe choices, ethical choices, when you are feeling that squeeze. We know just the amount of information in medicine can feel like pressure itself. Mm -hmm. So we're going to focus on the basics, the principles behind good decisions, things like you know, how GMC guidance plays into prioritizing ethical stuff and knowing when to say, okay, I need help here. Definitely. So maybe let's start there. What does coping under pressure actually mean in like a hospital setting. Good question. What does it look like day to day? Well, at its core, it's about staying calm enough basically to think straight, to make those safe ethical decisions even when you feel pulled in 10 different directions. Right. You know, picture it. Busy ward, bleep going off constantly, urgent stuff, maybe a patient who's suddenly becoming unstable, plus all the other tasks on your list. That's uh, that's pretty standard for foundation years. Yeah, that feeling of being totally swamped, I think everyone can relate to that. Mm -hmm. But even then, the fundamental expectations don't just vanish, do they? No, absolutely not. Even when it's chaos, you've still got to prioritize properly. Focus on who needs you most urgently. And communication, still key. Oh, vital. Clear, concise communication with patients, families, your colleagues, and, of course, maintaining your professionalism. Patient safety just can't be compromised no matter how busy things get. Cutting corners isn't an option. And I think a really powerful point from the sources we looked at was that basically being overworked is never an excuse for bad decisions. That's a hard line, but a necessary one. You have to keep that front and center. Okay, so you're in that chaotic moment, multiple demands. How do you even start sorting through it? Where do you begin? Right. That's where prioritization becomes absolutely crucial. It's probably the central skill for coping under pressure. Let's uh, let's take an example, something MSRA style. Okay. Imagine you've got these three things happening at once. Mr. B is acutely breathless, but he's on a ward a bit further away. Mrs. A has just told you she has new worrying chest pain. And Mr. C's family have been waiting quite patiently, actually, for a while to talk to a doctor. Right. Okay. Multiple polls. So how do you tackle that, thinking about GMC principles? Okay, well, the immediate sort of red flag for me is Mr. B, acute breathlessness. That screams potential life threat. He has to be first. Exactly right. Anything potentially life-threatening goes straight to the top, no question. Then what? Then, I'd say Mrs. A new chest pain is serious, needs checking out quickly, even if maybe not quite as immediate as the breathlessness seemed. Good. You're moving down the urgency ladder. Address the immediate threat, then the potentially serious new symptom. Which leaves Mr. C's family. Important, yes, you need to speak to them, be sensitive, but in this specific clash of priorities, their need is less clinically urgent than the other two. Perfect. That's the hierarchy. Clinical instability trumps everything else. It's about the patient's immediate physical safety first. Okay, that makes sense. So prioritization is key. What else is vital when you're under that kind of pressure? Well, something incredibly important is knowing your own limits, your own competence. Ah, uh, knowing your limitations. Sounds simple, but I guess especially when you're junior, you want to help, you want to do things. There must be a temptation to just try and handle whatever comes your way. There absolutely is, and that's exactly where it can become dangerous. You see, safe practice isn't about being some kind of medical genius who can do everything. It's about recognizing, okay, this specific task or this patient's complexity is actually beyond my current experience or skill level. And when you recognize that? Then the safe, the responsible thing to do is escalate, ask for help, or delegate it, if appropriate, to someone more senior, someone who does have the expertise. It's far better than, you know, having a go and potentially causing harm. That seems crucial. So the MSRA isn't just testing if you can juggle tasks. It's looking for that self-awareness, that ability mm. to say, I need help appropriately. Precisely. It's actually a sign of a good, safe doctor. Not weakness. It's reflective practice. And I suppose your own state ties into this, too, like being exhausted or burnt out. Definitely. Your own health, your well-being, it directly impacts your ability to make safe decisions. If you're severely fatigued, your judgment can be impaired. 
recognizing when you aren't fit to practice safely is also part of this whole picture of coping under pressure. It's all interconnected. Okay, let's really dig into a specific scenario now. One that brings in the ethical side under time pressure. Sounds good. So we have an FY1. They're asked to get consent for a hip hemiarthroplasty quickly. The registrar and consultant are literally heading to theater. Big time pressure. Okay, a classic squeeze. And there are five possible actions. Let's break them down option by option. Thinking about the GMC guidance. Option C is ranked top, most appropriate. Explain, you're not experienced enough to consent for this specific operation. Why is that the best answer? Because it hits that core GMC principle square on, work within your competence. As a brand new FY1, it's, well, it's almost certain you don't have the detailed knowledge needed for that specific procedure. You mean like the risks, benefits, alternatives? Exactly. All the things a patient needs for informed consent. Trying to do it without that deep understanding, that's unsafe. It's ethically dodgy. The rule here is really a safe refusal is always, always better than unsafe compliance. Crystal clear. Trying to wing it could mean the patient doesn't really understand what they're agreeing to. Okay, what about option D? Ask an SHO from another team, someone who can do hip hemiarthroplasties, to take consent. It's ranked appropriate, but maybe not ideal. Yeah, appropriate, but not ideal sums it up. It shows you're thinking responsibly, you know your limits, you're escalating to someone competent. That SHO likely does have the surgical knowledge. So why isn't it ideal? Well, that SHO probably doesn't know the patient, right? Doesn't know their full history, doesn't have that relationship the patient's own team has. It might affect the sort of nuance of the consent chat. But still, faced with the time pressure, getting someone competent involved is much safer than you doing it. Okay, so it's a practical safer step, if not perfect. Now, option E, agree to do it, but then ask experienced nurses to show you how. This one's ranked inappropriate. Why? Even though there's an intent to learn. Ah, the intent is good, but the action is flawed. It misunderstands what consent for major surgery involves. Nurses are incredibly skilled and vital, but training someone for surgical consent isn't typically part of their role. It's a specific medical responsibility. Exactly. It requires deep clinical understanding of the procedure, the patient's specifics, the risks. That's doctor territory. Agreeing to do something you're not qualified for, even if you plan to quickly learn how, that's risky. It's inappropriate. Remember, workload pressure doesn't make it okay to step outside your competence. That really draws the line between, you know, learning proactively and taking on something unsafe. Okay, now the unsafe options. Option A. Consent the patient before doing other routine jobs. Why unsafe? Because it prioritizes getting the task done over doing it properly. It focuses on ticking the box quickly, but ignores the fact that you, the FY1, aren't competent to have that conversation. So the consent wouldn't really be valid? Potentially not. If the patient hasn't had a proper explanation from someone who truly understands it, is it really informed consent? It's ethically flawed. Even doing it sooner doesn't fix the fundamental problem your lack of expertise for this specific consent. Right. Efficiency doesn't trump ethics or safety. Okay, last one, option B. Finish your urgent ward round jobs first, then go consent the patient. Ranked least appropriate. What makes this the worst? Well, it combines the big problem from option A, you planning to consent outside your competence with adding a significant delay. So doing the wrong thing, but later. Pretty much. You're still planning to do something you shouldn't, and by delaying it, you increase the chance that this flawed consent process might just slip through the cracks before surgery. It's unsafe, professionally irresponsible, and frankly, could lead to serious legal trouble down the line. It shows a real failure to grasp your limits and the importance of proper, timely consent. Wow, okay. Breaking it down like that really shows the layers of reasoning. It's all about safety and ethics under pressure, isn't it? Not just speed. Absolutely. That scenario is exactly what the MSRA is trying to gauge. Can you stay calm enough to make decisions that protect the patient and uphold standards, even when the clock's ticking? Being junior is never a justification for unsafe shortcuts. Okay, so to really hammer these principles home, what are the key takeaways, the sort of guidelines for staying safe when that pressure builds? Yeah, there are some really good clinchers to keep in mind. First, pause. When things get frantic, take a breath, reassess. Don't just react. Good advice. What else? Second, document, especially in high-pressure situations. Write down your key decisions and your reasoning. It protects everyone. Third, and this is huge, never, ever let someone pressure you into doing something you know is unsafe or beyond your competence. Stand your ground, politely but firmly. Exactly. And fourth, 
escalate clearly and respectfully. If you need help, ask for it properly. Don't just hope someone notices. Those are great, really practical points. What about common mistakes, things junior doctors tend to do when overwhelmed? We do see patterns uh, like ignoring an urgent bleep because you're trying to finish paperwork. That's a big one. Prioritizing admin over a potentially sick patient. Yes. Or the flip side, maybe focusing on routine jobs when a patient is clearly deteriorating. And as we've just discussed in depth, taking on high risk things, complex procedures, tricky consents without the right supervision or skill. It all comes back to that clinical priority and self-awareness, doesn't it? Is there a simple way to structure your thinking in the moment? There's a useful little framework, the three R's. First, recognize urgency. Get good at spotting those clinical red flags that need immediate action. Okay, recognize. Second, respond safely. That might mean you act if it's within your scope or you delegate or you escalate. It depends on the situation and your competence. Respond safely. And the third R. Reflect afterwards. After things calm down, take a minute. What went well? What was tough? What did you learn? What might you do differently next time? Recognize, respond, reflect. That's really helpful. And it ties into some of those key vault pearls too, right? Absolutely. Like this one. Consent isn't just a form. It's a legal and ethical agreement built on trust, clarity, and competence. If you can't explain it properly, you can't get proper consent. Simple as that. And the other big one. Safe doctors don't strive to do everything they focus on doing the right things in the right order and under the right conditions. That really sums it up. The MSRA and safe practice in general, it isn't about being a superhero who juggles everything. It's about sound ethical judgment under pressure. Exactly. Even if that judgment call is, I can't do this safely, I need help, that is good judgment. It comes down to clear prioritization based on clinical need, knowing your own capabilities realistically, and having the professionalism to escalate when needed. Patient safety has to be the bottom line. Always. So as we wrap up this deep dive on coping under pressure, those are the core ideas. Prioritize clinically, know your limits, escalate appropriately. Safe practice comes first, and the MSRA looks for doctors who get that, even when things are tough. Definitely. We'd really encourage you, the listener, to think about these principles. How would you apply them, not just in an exam, but on the ward tomorrow? And that leads us to maybe a final thought to chew on. In our health system, there's often huge pressure for efficiency, for getting things done quickly. How can junior doctors stick to that vital principle, working within their competence without feeling like they're you know, slowing the team down or letting people down. That's a really tricky balance, isn't it? A real world challenge. It is. And maybe something we can explore more in future deep dives, looking at team dynamics, speaking up safely, that kind of thing. But for now, thank you for joining us for this deep dive.